Hello, and welcome to this investor webinar for Coda Minerals. I'm Paul Armstrong from Reed Corporate. Thanks very much for joining us today. Coda has three areas of activity that will be shown to you today. The company's on track to complete a scoping study on its Elizabeth Creek Copper Cobalt project. It's also uh, about to undertake a geophysical survey to evaluate the potential for multiple mineralised conduits at the ME IOCG discovery in South Australia. And drilling is about to start at the Cameron River Copper Gold Project in Queensland. I'll now pass to CODA Chief Executive Chris Stevens, who's happy to take questions at the end of his presentation. If you'd like to ask a question, please click on the Q&A tab, and we'll endeavour to put as many of those questions as we can to Chris at the end of the presentation. Over to you, Chris. Good morning, everyone in uh, West Australia, and good afternoon, uh, over East. Thank you for joining us on the uh, webinar this morning. And um, look, I, I realise this, we do this, try and do this at least sort of once every four to six weeks. Uh, apologies to anyone who was looking to join last week. Unfortunately, I finally uh, finally managed to get COVID and uh, um, ordered the uh, wrong version and got the, the fairly heavy version. So if my voice is cracking today, uh, then again, I do apologise. I'm not sure whether it's uh, the wrong variant, unlucky genetics, or the uh, stress of uh, working over the last year, but um, it's certainly been an interesting week. So I will do my very best today to um, sort of talk you through everything without my voice cracking too much and uh, to, to get through this. Those of you who have joined before will uh, hopefully sort of uh, know that this is a reasonably relaxed uh, fireside style chat, sort of talking through and providing as much detail and colour um, on the information behind the company announcements, uh, some of the thinking and the strategy that goes into Coda Minerals and really giving you access. Um, and I, I tend to find I really sort of enjoy these sessions and often get a lot of feedback as well on the info line um, and also Q&A. So sort of, again, I, I always sort of say this, but I'm very aware that the length of a minute is not equal. It depends on which side, you know, whether you're giving the presentation or whether you're uh, listening to the presentation. So sort of knowing um, that time can drag on, I'll try and move through things fairly quickly uh, and also provide a mix for anyone who's new to the story. I will provide some background, but again, um, really try and keep it to providing information because I'm aware that most people are quite familiar with the story at this point and are really looking to understand the thinking behind uh, a lot of what's going on as well. You know, you see the announcements, but obviously there's an enormous amount of work goes on in the background. So with that, I'll move on um, reasonably quickly through this. And again, I'm very happy to take questions at the end. Paul, read them out. Um, and also, um, if you email info at codaminerals.com, that comes straight through to me. And you you know you can email chris.stevens as well, um, if you remember that. But info at Coda Minerals comes through to me as well. And I do try and answer every single email that comes through. So I'll draw your attention to the usual disclaimers. And I'll, I'll sort of obviously, again, highlight where things need a reasonably clear disclaimer throughout the session. Um, obviously, to keep within market rules, I can't talk about anything that's not uh, fully cleansed in the market. Um, but there is often, as I say, a lot of information and colour behind that that we can talk to as well. Um, so really recapping for those people who are maybe a little bit new to the story. Um, but again, the strategic focus here is we believe very strongly in the future of copper. We believe very, very much whatever your politics, whatever your views on energy transition, this is something that is happening something that is likely to be uh, sped up, I think, by not only recent climate events in Europe and in Australia, um, but also the changes geopolitically, globally, especially in regard to Russian gas. Um, and I think you will see you know, an increase in pace rather than the other way around um, in the energy transition piece and copper and cobalt are fundamentally important to that. Um, I'm someone who likes to invest in things of real fundamental value. I, I'm not saying you shouldn't invest in Bitcoin, but I personally don't because I don't understand it well enough. But what I do understand is the future of energy transition. It's something I've been working on for a very long time. Um, and I believe very strongly in part of copper of that. Um, that's where I'll really stop talking about copper. Again, I, I believe very strongly in that supply demand piece. And I believe companies that are building resources in copper will be in a very strong position over the next decade. So what are we doing to ensure that we do? Because you can talk about the future of markets, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have strong projects. 
Um, however, over the last year and a half, we have turned exploration into resources and we have arrived at three distinct value drivers for the company. You know, uh, Paul was just saying before we came on, you know, too many companies out there just don't do enough. Um, and so I hope that by the end of this, I think most people will understand what our three value drivers are, but you also understand just what we're doing in the background and, and where those news flow points are coming. Three distinct drivers, very clearly, Emmy Bluff, uh, advanced, advanced stage, certainly advanced study stage, uh, copper and cobalt. So the scoping study is coming and I will talk to that in detail today. MEICG, uh, interesting, the gift that kind of keeps on uh, giving, keeps on almost giving. It's a really fantastic opportunity. Um, these things are challenging. And again, um, it, it has been an unbelievable ride over the last year. We put out an announcement this morning. I'm certainly going to provide some more color on that today as well. Um, but again, it, you know, it, it, it's a really interesting, fascinating beast of a thing. And I'm going to say, talk a little bit about that in about 15 minutes time. And then Cameron River, we will be drilling shortly. Our uh, senior geologists got on a plane yesterday. Uh, we'll be arriving in Mount Isa today, as is our operations manager. It's all happening. Um, and so we're pretty excited. So you want activity? There's a lot of activity happening here at Coda Minerals. Uh, won't dwell on this too much. You'll note the share price uh, has increased reasonably significantly over the last 10 days. Um, had a few comments suggesting it's because I've been uh, in bed with COVID that that's happened. Um, if, if it is, I'm very happy to go back to bed. But the uh, the reality is that um, I think the markets are recovering somewhat. I think there's also an element of the um, Oz Minerals and BHP. You know, I think whatever your views on that in terms of value, it's a very strong sign that the majors believe strongly in the future of copper and possibly also, certainly in my opinion, believe that we're in a bit of a... Uh, lull in terms of commodity pricing and uh, looking to take advantage of that so again um i think there has been a little bit of a halo effect there but also you know i still strongly believe we're undervalued at anything um at these current prices and so it's been nice to see things recover a little bit um and you know long long may that continue also we'll be working to keep pushing that re-rate back to more reasonable valuation levels market cap 54 even we're sitting on well over a million tons of contained copper and resources, plus the OCG, plus the excitement at Cameron River, that's still uh, a very reasonable valuation um, and very undervalued in my opinion. Cash balance is strong. We're certainly not come raised. We had $8 million at the end of the last quarter um, and we've moved to a much more cash, um, slower cash burn, put it that way. Um, and that's for very sound geological reasons. That's more to do with geology than it is to do with cash. Talking of valuation, look, we're sitting at about half, just under half of Shore and Partners research. This is research that, you know, we don't pay for this. We don't have any agreements with Shore. Um, this is, you know, we were approached and, you know, they wanted to do the research piece. And I, I think it's been done very well, actually. Um, it's a good organization. I actually have a background in doing a lot of this peer comp business development financial modeling myself. So I can be quite critical of methods. And uh, again, I think this, my personal view is this has been done very well. Um, EV over resource can be at times misleading, uh, but it's, it's almost certainly, in my opinion, the best proxy for um, you know, value when you're looking at peers across copper ranges. And again, you know, this was this was when Kyle was seeing about thirty cents. So that that EV over resource has come up a little bit, but still uh, around about thirty five forty dollars per ton, with a peer average of one hundred and forty dollars per ton. Um, what this means is that if and you know I believe um, you know obviously very much in what we're doing in terms of the scoping study. If we can get these next pieces right, then there is a very realistic expectation of a re rate up to. You know, levels of, of peers. And again, please read the report. You can click on this link. It should take you straight through to that um, for all of the disclaimers and details as well. Um, but again, I, I, I believe that uh, I believe this has been done quite well and it just shows a significant uptick potential um, as we move through the next work. So in terms of that work, um, 
these are new slides. We, we, we sort of try and present this. There's a very busy slide talking about just how much we've done over the last year and a half, how much activity has happened. Uh, but again, going back to those sort of value drivers, we've got the study of the sedimentary copper cobalt, over a million tons of contained copper equivalent defined into primarily jaw indicated resources over three deposits. The IOCG, um, this incredible, challenging, fascinating beast of a thing, right in the heart of elephant country. Cattle grid, you won't have seen much about. It's very much a, a third and um, much less important part. But again, I tend to have a view that increasing copper resources is the right thing to do, and this is sitting there. Um, so we're working through that as well. Um, you can see on the right-hand side of the slide just how much we've done over the last uh, year and a half. I think there's a couple of things which have been missed a little bit by the market, you know, very strong focus on the ICG, which is understandable. It is exciting. It is a very real high reward opportunity, but the resource has been a significant, a significant resource, 43 million tons of 1.84. By the time you start putting cutoff grades onto that, you're getting into really quite significant copper equivalent um, numbers. And again, the, the great tonnage curve is in the, um, is in the, the original release. The acquisition of Torrens taking us to 100%. I, I, it's one of those things that, you know, for the last year, I, I don't know, I think I had a meeting with a sophisticated fund where they didn't say to me, Chris, why haven't you done this? Um, and we do it and the market hasn't responded very well. But if you want to commercialize, if you want to be taken seriously, if you want predators to look at you, if you want to develop a mine, you need 100%. And it was hard work and, it, and you know, we got it done. And um, again, I don't think the market responded to that quite as much as it should have done, um, but I think it's one of those things that in the longer term will stand us in very good stead. Scoping study and the ICG physics watch this space. Um, so again, a lot happening, um, a lot of work completed and a lot of work going forwards in terms of real genuine catalysts to create shareholder value. The um, Cam River project, very much our second project, although um, you know, an exciting uh, opportunity here. The reason I like this is very simple. Um, there are some wonderful targets. There's a lot of history here where it hasn't necessarily been in the right hands. Um, and prior to the current owner that we're farming into, you know, it's, it's really sat there in, in the center of this area without having the work done on it that I, I believe it warrants. Um, we've done an enormous amount of targeting. The drill rigs will be turning very shortly, and there are multiple targets here. Um, so again, we could be less than a month away from significant news flow um, in terms of drilling for copper in a really significant area. The next few slides are really quite familiar to most people. I'm just going to hit the highlights here very quickly and move through. The ME system um, is a is a fascinating thing for, for anyone who wants significant detail and I, I in truth I believe probably too much detail um, but read the appendix in the announcement that was put out this morning um, our geologist he's a very hard-working very intelligent academic guy and you know so I said write a two-page summary make it simple and what it got was a quite a detailed geological textbook um, but I will say, you know, the first two pages, we've summarized that uh, hopefully quite clearly. But again, I think it really does. It's, it's not easy to boil this down to simplicity. You know, this is a really interesting and unique um, system that I, I'm not aware anywhere else in the world where you've got two quite distinct styles of mineralization sitting next to each other. So ME Bluff, that's what we're doing the scoping study on. MEICG is in many ways what we became probably most famous for, which is that tech discovery within the iron oxide copper gold system. So you've got copper cobalt sitting above, you've got copper gold. There's a massive amount of plumbing, which we don't fully understand. We've got some ideas, and again, I'll talk to that in a moment, but um, there is just so much copper here in this system. It is such a significant system. And in many ways, um, in terms of the broader exploration, we're only just scratching the surface here. And so it's been an exciting year. Um, it's been a very challenging year, sort of delivering these uh, drill programs and also delivering the resource. Um, so sort of dwelling briefly on the ME Bluff, the copper cobalt. Um, what's new since I last 
presented, what, 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 what's worth understanding. And it's, it's really the announcement that we put out in early July, I believe it was July 4th from memory. Uh, it's available on the ASX platform on our website in terms of the mineralogical characteristics. Why does this matter? If you take anything away from the sort of scoping study part of today's webinar, it, it really should be this. When you're dealing with copper and to an even greater extent, copper cobalt, you need to be able to have a credible saleable product. Now, perceived wisdom is that you sell your first saleable product, which is usually a concentrate. That keeps CapEx down. There is always an element that you put in more downstream processing that increases overall costs, but it also increases the saleability, the reliability, and the payability of your products. Now, having options is always the best thing. You know, once you have options, once you understand what you can do technically, you can run those through the models and you can um, you know, deliver the optimal solution there. Some really good news here. The first is that the form of carolite we have, a form of cobalt we have is carolite. Most cobalt is locked up with pyrite, locked up with iron sulfides in Australia, certainly copper linked cobalt. That can be very difficult to liberate. It often requires what's pyrometallurgical um, processes. And those processes generally involve very high capexes and opexes as well. The form of carolite here is very simply liberated. In, in fact, it's pretty much a pure cobalt sulfide. It doesn't need to significant liberation. It floats 90% recovery off by flotation, which is incredible. If you look at global cobalt peers, that, that is significant. And then even better, this, this form of cobalt through a atmospheric, so we're not talking big autoclaves, we're not talking huge pyrometallurgical processes, we're talking a simple atmospheric leach, we've achieved 99% recovery to cobalt sulfate by Albion. So this is significant. We have, at a scoping study level, um, achieved confirmation that we are able to process this through to a saleable final product, which often incurs a significant premium to the LME cobalt price, which I'll remind you is one of the most stable and consistently highly priced um, metals out there. I mean, it's, it's the spot price being consistent around $90,000 at a time. So I won't dwell on that too much more, but again, this flow sheet work that we've done, it needs to go into the overall scoping study. But this was material news. From memory, the share price went down 10 or 20% that day. I mean, it was such a head scratcher to me when you put out news, which was, you know, we were jumping for joy in the office. So again, this is the value of some of these webinars in that hopefully I can provide you with that understanding a, a little bit of what we're thinking about this. But this is really good metallurgy. It, it's really favorable mineralogy. The work was done on very representative samples. And again, we put significant amount of information on the table one. And this is good news. And so again, these are some of these things. You don't get a lot of wins in this world. It, it really is a relentless forward progress and taking a lot of challenges where, when you, you're at this stage of the scoping study. So when you get those wins, it's time to celebrate. Um, so again, advanced flow sheet design. We've done four years on this. We really understand this mineralogy. And again, it is very favorable mineralogy as far as we um, have so far uh, worked through in, in the labs. And again, that's a lot of work. So solid, large resource, great mineralogy. Watch this space in terms of the next um, pieces from the scoping study. But again, you know, this, this was a win. Um, mining studies are well advanced. Again, scoping study, we're including all three of these deposits. So you've got the underground, and then you've got the two open pits. Underground, usually mine constrained as a general rule of, of, of mine, you know, underground mining. The two open pits look to have some significant advantages there. And again, for open pit, uh, sitting under some simple dune sand, um, these are reasonably solid grades and sizes as well. And I think that gets lost sometimes in the um, sort of overall conversation around the ME system is that there are these two other deposits sitting there. Now, in terms of the scoping study, I've been telling people end of September, early October, uh, we're still aiming for an October release. Um, really what is outstanding at this point is primarily in regard to finalizing some, you know, ancillary areas. We kicked off uh, a sort of power study this morning, um, again, looking at all of the renewable mixes. So we're making sure that this has 
your really solid understanding, probably beyond the scoping level in truth. And then the mining. The mining is is fundamentally important to this. It, it's it's only fundamentally important in the much in so much as we've really controlled the meta processing because we've had much more time to work on that. So you can't obviously start a mining study until you've got a resource, um, and it's just going through all the options and being a little bit careful what I say in terms of not sort of uh, talking about anything that's either not very obvious or, or not already in the market. But really, there's a number of ways to mine these sorts of deposits. And I could point to something like Pamula Pakula, uh, which is an Ivanhoe deposit in Africa, which almost down to the you know, nearest 10 centimeters is a very similar thickness to any bluff. It's a different scale. There are some different characteristics to it. So it's not a perfect analog and certainly shouldn't be taken as such. But in terms of the mining side of things, we're talking very similar working heights. And, you know, we're just working through the various options, you know, board pillar, paste fill, looking at various forms of mechanical cutting as well. Now, every time you change one of these variables in the mine, you have to change everything else downstream. It's actually what I wrote my master's thesis on. It's very you know, integrated network planning. If you're doing it in silos, you're doing it wrong. So to do a thorough job of this takes some time. We're working through that. Um, we're very confident that we have uh, a number of ways that this can be mined. And we've also, again, seen analogs or uh, similar deposits um, you know, elsewhere in the world mind at these thicknesses. Um, what we're really doing is making sure we've done a thorough job on the scoping site and making sure everything through the value chain is fully integrated, fully understood. Trade-off costs between different, trade-off studies between different methods are properly conducted. And again, scoping study is a nebulous term in some ways. You know, it can be back of the envelope or it can be really high quality and, you know, with large elements which are closer to a proper sort of PA pre-feasibility. There, there's rarely a truly great definition of any of the levels of these studies. People have a go. Um, and really what we're doing is making sure that when this goes out, it is thoroughly done and has reasonable basis. And so that's where we're at. It will be the second half of this year. I'm very confident of that. Uh, we're aiming for October um, and the end of October um, should be a reasonable goal there. Um, and all the work is being done. It's, it, you know, actually really interesting and fascinating work and we've been very happy with where we're at um we just need to make sure all those last bits are done thoroughly and properly so that when you get something in your hand there's very reasonable basis for it so moving on to the iocg so we've talked about the study talked about where we're at this is a separate thing this, this is you know they shouldn't be confused um they are two very distinct value drivers the fact they sit so close to each other is in some ways frustrating, in some ways a good thing, because you know, frustrating in that you probably look at, you know, almost making them quite separate, even physically or structure-wise, if, if they were physically further apart. And the fact they're obviously very part of very much part of the same system has advantages. Um, those advantages primarily being understanding the plumbing in the system. So I'm just gonna take a quick breath and try and explain what the announcement this morning was about. Um, they're not easy to write these things. You know, you have a lot of technical information, you summarize it and oversimplify it, you fall foul of rules and you start to take leaps which aren't necessarily correct. Um, so getting that right level of uh, technical insight is, is somewhat challenging. Um, I'm not sure we always get it perfectly right. We probably err on the side of too much detail. But to give you our view, to give you what we understand right now, we made the first discovery hole, EB18. Uh, that was in June 20, 2021, so just over a year and a couple of months ago. Um, and that was an exciting discovery hole. A couple of hundred meters of intense alteration, 45, 50 meters of sulfides over 1%. To put that in context, the average mined grade of IOCGs in the region is just under 1%, it's usually around 0 0.8 to 0.9% copper. And so that discovery hole was very much in the ballpark of sensible grades. We proceeded on the basis that often these IOCGs have a major breccia pipe core. So what breccia means is cracked up, it's broken up. So usually the, the fluid in the system has come up with enough violence, enough pressure it's hit up against a blockage, and then that's caused an enormous explosion underground, which has created space for the copper to drop out. 
That is not always the case. And again, I think we've proven that with MEICG that that isn't exactly what has happened here. Um, but what generally you will see is, is when you have the sort of sim simpler uh, sort of carapatina style is that again you've had that breccia pipe there's been enormous amounts of pressure build up that's created space for the copper to drop out what we're seeing here is similar but different we're very confident that this has been created by the same mineralizing fluid that has created the other famous iocgs in the area we're reasonably confident as we could possibly be of that fact what we're seeing here is that there's been a granite thrust sheet has come in and, and there are some elements to that which are relatively, and this is this sort of pink that you can see on this diagram here, uh, and that's coming over the top. There's then conduits that were probably pre-existing fluid. And, and what's happened is rather than the sort of pressure building up and creating a huge violent event, what we've seen is that the copper has made its way through. To date, we found three of these conduits. And in so doing, has dropped out, seeped into the sediments around it, then been capped off by the um, by the granite to, to, to an extent. The granite is not entirely correlated with the mineralization. Okay, great. Geological stuff. Um, I'm not a geologist myself. As far as I understand it, that makes sense. You, you've got something which is an enormous plumbing system. It, the fluid has come through um, and it's found its way into conduits. What does that mean for future discovery then? So why is that? not bad news or why is that good news or, or why does that matter and as we understand it this matters because there really isn't a great explanation for the sheer volume and tenor you know bear in mind some of these intercepts are reasonably thick but also very high grade when compared to mined grades of other icgs in the area but also very high grade to some of the icgs which you don't necessarily know the names of because they never progressed past earlier stages, and I'm talking things like Cams in Fremantle Doctor, Vulcans still being explored, Punt Hill, um, you know, people are still working on those deposits, but they tend to be very diffuse. You tend to get 200 meters of 0.3, but you're not seeing the 15, 20 meters of very high grade copper that we've had assayed here, you know, in cases over three, three and a half percent. And so what we're looking for here is effectively more of that plumbing. We're looking for more of the conduits we're also looking around this area because of when you do get this buildup and this brecciation, they tend not to be very big, you know, two, 300 meters apart. So when you're dealing with an area that's one and a half, two square kilometers, um, you know, it's very easy to miss this. And so again, we're looking for more of this plumbing system. We're looking for areas where the conduits are bigger and thicker or more of the conduits to add, add to the ones we've got. And that's really good news. As we've started to understand this system, we've been able to say, okay, we think we've got a handle on what's happened here. It's 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 less, it's different to the sort of traditional ones that you see, or you know, Oak Down West, your Olympic Dam, your Carapatina, but it's also very different to the ones that you're less familiar with that tend to be these big diffuse things. And so how do we go and then chase that? We chase it through using modern geophysics. So again, we should, with the deployment of this exosphere um, technology from fleet um, geoscience, these are geophones which effectively, they talk to satellites, they're buried, they use both ambient and uh, you know, people made anthropogenic noise. So everything from trucks passing to you know, very minor seismic activity, they, they tend to be buried for a period of time um, and you can see this again in real time to it communicates. And what you're really looking for here is to fully image the paleo surface and then to look at understanding it often correlated with the iron sulfides, this is so iron oxides, the iron oxide, copper gold, the IO of the ICG, and then looking for those conduits. This image here is actually taken, it's public. And um, again, if you go to the released this morning, we've included the link to the YouTube video that's on there. So if you've got 20 minutes spare, go and have a watch. It's actually quite an interesting video. And you can see this is really game changing in the amount of resolution you get under cover. And we believe that when we run these studies, we will be able to identify more of these conduits, more of these structures. And again, if there has been a major brachiation structure there, we should also be able to see that. The other really cool thing about this is it will almost certainly see the tap lead. So this is the formation of 400 meters that hosts Emmy Bluff. Because again, remember, these are 
part of the same system. So if there are more ME bluffs out there, if ME bluff extends, and we've got a lot of evidence that it does, except in the drill hole, uh, which is ultimately the best evidence you can have, but there's a lot of geophysical evidence out there that ME bluff extends. It's so big as it stands, we may not actually need or want more scale, um, but again, having options helps with scale. So this will show us three things, we hope. The first is conduits and structures within that major gravity anomaly. And so we've stopped drilling. It's the right thing to do. We have enough drilling to correlate against geophysics. Um, so rather than keep drilling blindly, we should be able to use this geophysics to better target future drilling. The second is we will be able to extend out. This is a, a large area that will be um, under study here. So with, and I'll just go on to the next slide to explain this. Um, with the next area there, you've got uh, a number of other anomalies which we should be able to see and look at as well. So is any bluff a subpart of a bigger structure which is sitting next door? You know, this would cost tens of millions of dollars to fence line drill and then some. Um, but the geophysics should be able to give us a lot of answers to that. And the third thing is, does ME bluff extend? Again, we have uh, MT data, we have other seismic data that suggests it does, but we have drill holes, which to date, we haven't intersected additional mineralization outside of that existing place in the ho um, host ME bluff. So we've got quite high hopes for this, um, and we'll be uh, putting that into action in December. So again, this webinar and some of that information comes from a conversation I had where I was sort of explaining, you know, what we're doing and really saying MEISCG has been a very exciting discovery. Um, it hasn't some, been something yet which we have fully pulled together and understood, and that is entirely usual for any company of any size at this stage of an exploration program. We have a plan. We know what we're doing next. We have a plan. We're going to implement that plan. Let's see what the results of that are. Um, but again, um, you know, this, this is very much remains a live opportunity, not only within MEICG, but within the broader area as well. If it works and, uh, you know, based on the amazing information we've seen from what other people have done with this, we believe it should work very well. We will then be able to apply that to central lane zone, which is phenomenally and incredibly prospective. That's a longer longer burn that's obviously not going to happen this this in this calendar year um but uh you know let's get the results first and then see if we can apply it elsewhere as well but exciting we're really energized by this um with about another five minutes i'm just going to talk briefly to camera river and um i actually love this slide I, katrina our phenomenal um senior analyst put this together yesterday because she was trying to understand why we're drilling in certain places and, and what the evidence for that is. Now, ultimately, evidence is, is just, you know, it's good targeting and we've done a lot of work. You know, we're at the point now where I can talk for the next hour or the next minute. It's not going to change a thing. We just need to drill it and drill it. We shall be doing in five days time. Um, but the, you know, you can see here the wealth of targets and also the area that we're working in. You know, we're just up the road from Mary Kathleen, um, but there, there are some significant copper uh, mines in the area and copper discoveries. We're 90 k's up the road from Carnaby. Um, again, we're using a lot of, we've been watching what they do and effectively replicating a lot of that. I think they do a really great job and they've obviously got a smart geological team. And, um, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. IP has been driving this. So again, you can see GAIP, conductivity, chargeability, DDIP, these are all forms of this IP that have been so successful in the area. So five really solid targets here. Um, again, we'll be drilling in a few days time. Uh, I believe the pads start getting built on the 23rd from memory, but it, it's, it's happening. So um, again, I can talk at length, but the drill rigs will tell the story. The good news here is that uh, generally I hate using um, those of you who talk to me separately one-on-one -on -one will know how much I hate XRF results. They can lead you a merry dance, um, especially diamond drilling. This is a little bit different. This is very commonly, XRF is very commonly used for this because it's RC drilling. You put it into a bag, you smash it up and you, you XRF the bag. And instead of getting a five cent size piece that penetrates a few millimeters into a piece of diamond core, which really doesn't mean a whole lot um, other than indicative that you're looking at 
chalcum pyrite rather than pyrite or you know something that's mineralized um with this you have much greater you know ability to say that an xrf is representative um so we'll be using an xrf extensively on site so that news flow should come pretty quickly um with that sorry i'm talking slightly longer than i planned but um uh, as you can tell i get excited there's a lot of stuff happening here and uh, we believe the value proposition is very strong. Um, so why invest in CODA? Again, hopefully I've explained that very clearly um, today. We have a scoping study that's advancing into what we expect to be, and many analysts expect to be a very strong copper bull market um, with major supply constraints. We're building resources. We've got a track record of turning ideas into jork resources. Uh, now we're turning that into a scoping study. I don't know what the results of that are yet. We're still working through it, but we do know we're focusing on the right things um, and that their work is advancing rapidly. The IOCG, look, I appreciate 200 meters of Bornite straight in the third hole may have been a better outcome than sort of the interesting, highly, uh, you know, it, it's a fascinating one. It's very rare you see these drill holes just returning mineralization after mineralization. We found a major plumbing system here for copper. There's enormous amounts of fluid has come through this very significant amounts of minerals. Uh, we have more work to do here, but it is very much still an incredible, exciting and awesome opportunity that I'm very thankful to be involved with. Uh, and then Cow River, um, let's see what that turns up. But uh, if it's uh, a tenth as good as our geologists seem to be excited that it will be then uh, it will still be very good um so again the only thing you can do at this point is to drill it so with that i will pause for questions and uh, you know, thank you for your patience i realize half an hour is quite a long time to be talking thanks very much chris we have a couple of questions and a reminder to anyone who would like to ask a question please click on the q a tab and send it through and we'll put it to chris chris one uh viewer has asked Re Emmy Bluff, do you have enough uh, resource, enough inventory to drive a project there? Is there scale, I think, is probably the question. And is there scope to grow that inventory in parallel with these studies that you are doing? Or have you closed it off, in effect? Uh, so we have closed it off reasonably well. I think with Jork indicated, you, you know what is there within the immediate resource area. And so, the short answer is yes, we believe we have not only enough, but more than enough in some ways. The challenge with a deposit like this is to be able to mine it quick enough. So more resources may not necessarily be, you know, when you're dealing with the time value of money, you know, taking a mine life from, and I'm going to do hand wavy figures, which are non-dual compliant and not necessarily representative. But, you know, if you go from, from X number of years to X plus five, that doesn't necessarily give you a better economic outcome. So the things that we're focusing on are optimizing the grade tonnage curve and using a, one of the sort of three key mining methods that you would look to do this um, to pick the method with the lowest, obviously lowest cost, lowest capex goes without saying, but also the right mix of the fastest mining. Because you mine this in 10 years versus 15 years versus 20 years, that is a big difference in the economic outcome here. So again, more resources does not necessarily mean better economic outcomes. If it was 10 million ton resource, then yeah, I'd be worried. Uh, 43 million tons by the time you've optimized it on the great tonnage curve is a significant resource. Um, and if you look at something like Camilla Kukula, which is massive, I mean, absolutely huge, the resource is about 10 times. Um, but again, the challenge is there of being able to mine it quick enough. So I don't know if that's answered the question well. If there is, what would not hurt, what would, what would, what I would be quite happy with is to find a second one next door. And so extending it by 10, 20 percent, no, I don't think it's going to make a whole lot of difference. Doubling it and having a second mine next door that you can run through the same plant, yeah, that would be nice. And we are currently reasonably drill unconstrained for nine kilometers to the east. And the seismic study, reasonably confident, even more than what it'll show on the ICG, it'll show if there's any more Tapley, which is the host mineralization. So if it's there, I think we will hopefully see it in the next uh, few months. In the meantime, now, another, I think we have. Okay, now another viewer has focused on Cameron River asking the question, why hasn't this been tested 
before to a greater extent? <laughs> um, it's one of those things where uh, I, I'll give you the honest answer and then be anxious afterwards that I shouldn't have told you the honest answer, but I, I think it's been in the hands of some lifestylers. Um, the industry is plagued by lifestylers. I personally think that if you're fortunate enough to be involved in these fascinating, exciting opportunities, you should give it everything, boots and all. And, you know, that hasn't always been the case. Um, there's been a couple, I always joke that if there were more historians in the mining industry, especially the exploration industry, there would be many more discoveries and a lot fewer disasters. And the reality is you look at this and in some cases it's gone into the hands of companies just as the copper price has gone south and it's been very hard to fund it. In other cases, it seems to have just sat there. I mean, half of the tenure was never even properly, no one even did any basic um, exploration on it. The, the other thing is that IP is what has driven discovery in this area and Carnaby has been a beautiful example of a company that really gets it and really is driving this through good science in my opinion. And some of those techniques are relatively modern. Um, it's goat country, it's, it's hard to, it is hard country to, to explore it. Um, and so the ability to use these modern IP techniques has been uh, very, very helpful as well. The geologist has done a lot of the legwork. He's an ultra marathon runner as well. So um, we've had the advantage of having someone who's been more than happy to run the goat country and, and actually do the legwork, which a lot of geologists are keen to do. Yeah, so not, not such modern techniques there. It's the, Another, it's yeah. the old fashioned and the modern <laughs> together. <laughs> uh, he hasn't walked the ground so much as run it. So yeah, I think he genuinely has, yeah. Another question a viewer has asked, is the scoping study being done in-house or has it been outsourced to an engineering firm? Uh, it's a mixture. And so we have uh, a metallurgical group that we have worked with now for four years and they've done all of the work. Um, they've done all of the work on the Met side. Uh, we've had effectively two engineering firms, both very reputable, both, both very talented and you know, good good firms, uh, Zenith Mining Plus, working with the um, underground mining as well. Um, and then the overall study manager has been seconded into us from a very well-known uh, engineering firm here. So it's a mixture, um, but all done very much peer reviewed um, as well. Um, the final write-up is being done by a specialist set from Rome. So we haven't just outsourced it and gone, right, you guys do that. It's effectively done in house. Um, but it, it's very much a, a, a sort of a hub and spoke model in terms of that, which you know, I think uh, works. Now, the final, well. final question, Chris, has come through. Our last question, unless anyone has any more, of course, send them through. But a viewer has referred to that. I think they're talking about the slide you showed early on with the Shores report, um, saying, why do you think the stock will re rate? Look, EV over resource is a. Uh, it's a good proxy. It's, it's a bit like the joke about um, is it, um, democracy being the worst form of government except for all of the other options. And I think EV over resource is the worst form of valuing a company except for all the other ways to do it. You know, in the absence of a properly done scoping study, feasibility study, everything else, it's, it, it's, it's a reasonable proxy for understanding what people are valuing a ton of copper in the ground at. And again, we have a significant resource. It's a large resource. Um, but I believe that there are people out there who still have questions around how it all works together. You know, being underground makes things challenging immediately. Being relatively narrow and underground makes things, again, more challenging. And it's, it's one of those fascinating things. I'll often sit at conferences and someone will say, oh, God, it'll work fine. And someone else, another mining engineer will come up 10 minutes later and goes, oh, I'm not sure about it. You know, it, it. It's one of those things. Now, you know, there is no substitute for months of hard study by experts so you know opinions are discounted but the reality is i think people are waiting to see the results of that work and unfortunately it's just one of those cases that time is linear you, you can't bring these things forward you you get your resource we did that again we've done two massive drill programs on time on budget over the last couple of years safely on time on budget then you go in and you do that work and so why do I think it'll re-rate? Because I believe people will start to understand more of the technical aspects of that. I think the other reason, and I'll be very open here, is that sometimes you become famous for something. Um, 
And becoming famous for something isn't necessarily a bad thing. And in our case, that was the IOCG intercept. But then any bluff has been lost in the noise of that. And so understanding that a company has three very distinct value drivers and they are being advanced, um, you know, they're being advanced with, with gusto um, is not something that all investors necessarily comprehend. So again, I think there's been a messaging piece. So when, when we get that technical work and people start to see that in what we expect to be an improving market and obviously a copper deficit, I think those things are what's going to drive re -rank. Sorry, that was a horribly long answer, but it's actually not an easy question to answer either. Uh, <clears throat> it's a terrific answer. That's, that, I can see the upside there, Chris. It's, it's fantastic. It's a great presentation. As you say, some of it probably has been lost. Um, a nice problem to have in the longer term, but of course, the idea is to, to get that message out about what you have at ME Bluff in addition to the IOCG and the drilling program. Um, you mentioned that a lot of people in this game are, uh, are lifestylers. They plug their life support system into a company and, and a shareholder's funds and there's a, there's a lack of action. Nobody could say there's a lack of action here. There's obviously a whole series of news flow coming up between now and Christmas. And uh, that's what investors in small mid cap companies want. They need, they need that news flow. They need to know that their money's being put into the ground. And uh, that's clearly what you're doing. Thanks very much for your time today. Great presentation. I hope everybody enjoyed that. As Chris said, he, he endeavors to respond to every question that's sent through to him via those email addresses that he outlined at the start of the presentation. So please feel free to avail yourself of that great opportunity for have a chief executive who's open and willing to talk and provide such great insights. Thanks again, Chris. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Thanks, Chris Paul. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone.